Ocarina of Time is, at least in my incredibly contrarian opinion, a pretty good video game. Not only did Ocarina of Time successfully bring the Zelda series into the third dimension, but it also ended up being highly influential, shaping certain conventions in gaming up until today. Long story short, Ocarina of Time is widely considered to be an absolute masterpiece. But like every masterpiece, this piece of art is composed of different pieces, and one of those pieces are the wicked dungeons that Link has to explore on his journey to save his beloved princess. The dungeons are the place where all the different parts of Ocarina Arena of time, like combat, exploration and puzzle solving, are put to the test the most. And they are really, really interesting places to take a closer look at, for a lot of different and sometimes surprising reasons. So today we're going to leave our beloved Mushroom Kingdom, in order to go on to a research expedition into the mysterious land of Hyrule. We're not only going to take a closer look back at all the fantastic and mysterious dungeons in Ocarina of Time, but we will also discuss how they are designed, what works about them, and most importantly, we are finally going to answer the eternal and YouTube format friendly question. Which one of Ocarina of Time's dungeons is the best one, and which one? is the absolute worst. So are you ready? Let's do this. Alrighty right, so before we take a deep dive into all the mysterious dungeons hidden in Hyrule, we probably should establish a couple of things first. So first, what even qualifies as a dungeon in Ocarina of Time? Well, for the sake of this video, everything in Ocarina of Time where we find a map in a chest counts as a dungeon. So the bottom of the well counts as a dangerous dungeon because of map, while the Gerudo training grounds do not count because of lack of map. Hooray! Second, we're going to use our four fuzzy rated ranking system. We're going to rank the different dungeons in Ocarina of Time on a scale from one to five fuzzies. Five fuzzies being the best score, one fuzzy the worst obviously. So let's hop into the first dungeon, located in the middle of the wonderful forest. Let's grab the rupees we need to buy the stuff necessary to impress our friend and true hero of the story in disguise, Mido, and let's enter the majestic Deku Tree. The Deku Tree is very vertical. One of the central puzzles of the dungeon, for example, requires us to jump from the very top of the dungeon through the spider web into the infected basement at the bottom. The Deku Tree is as vertical as Zelda dungeons get, and I always found this focus on verticality really interesting. See, the thing is the following. Ocarina of Time is the first 3D entry in the Zelda series, and if there is one thing that is really hard to do in 2D, then it is verticality. The shift to 3D allowed the team to do a really vertical dungeon for the very first time. And it is kind of interesting that they chose the very first dungeon to be the most vertical one. First dungeons usually introduce concepts and test that everyone understands the most central mechanics of the game, which always left me wondering if the focus on verticality is here because they felt the need to teach players about the vertical nature of the game. You know, nowadays it almost feels trivial to pull out the bow and to scan the upper area of a room for an eye or a hidden switch or something. But back in 1998, it was the first time that players explored the Zelda dungeon with three amazing dimensions. Stuff like using perspective in puzzles or hiding stuff about the natural camera angle simply were novelties. So they may have felt the need to tutorialize this new verticality in order to get people used to it. And maybe that is the reason why the Deku tree ended up being so tall. But in all fairness, that's a bit speculative. It could also just be that they settled on the Deku tree as the first dungeon for story reasons and that it simply made sense to design a tree vertically, since, you know, Last time I checked, that was how trees worked. So, does the Deku Tree succeed in its function of teaching everyone the most basic concepts of the game? Overall, I'd say, the Deku Tree does a fantastic job at that. It's basically a huge teaching lab that introduces the most important gameplay elements by challenging us to solve the most simple puzzle possible with it. We have to inflame a torch that stands directly beside the lit one. We have to use our dive ability once to hit a switch. We are actually introduced to switches. We have to shoot down a ladder to ensure that we understand how the fairy slingshot works, we push down a block, shoot one of those eyes conveniently placed directly above the door it opens, you know, the most basic Zelda stuff in its most basic iteration. And honestly, I love it. It feels like a natural and completely normal dungeon experience. The overgrown, infected tree setup really does wonders to hide that we're basically running through a tutorial. Whenever I replay Ocarina of Time, I look forward to making my way through the Deku Tree, which, you know, great job Deku Tree, you made me look forward to the tutorial of a game I've probably beaten a dozen of times. That's a close to perfect score of four fantastic fuzzies for you. Good tree. Also, 
Um, in the basement, there is this puzzle where we first have to learn the correct combination in which the deku scrubs need to be attacked and only if we enter the correct code we are allowed to proceed. Something like that only happens once in the game and it feels a bit weird and out of place when it happens. That's actually not important right now, but it will pop up again in a minute, so um, I don't know, like put a mental pin into this deku scrub or whatever you need to do in order to not forget your deku scrubs. Awesome. So after successfully murdering the Deku Tree, our journey of death and destruction proceeds to the fittingly named Death Mountain. The local Gorons there are sad and hungry, or they are sad because they're hungry. I, I don't know and I'm not going to look it up. Anyway, a dangerous evil has infested Dodongo's cavern, the place where the Gorons harvest the delicious stones which they love to devour. Oh no. Luckily, we are here to help and after a short trip through the Forgotten Woods where we learn a song to make the Runia feel like a little Goron kid again, we're on our way to cleanse the second dungeon. So Dodongo's cavern is structured around the central room featuring a central Dodongo's skull thingy. The dungeon is actually very linear. At first we go to our left, but the path there loops back into the skull room, then we hit a switch and go back through the room to the other side where we fight our way up to the second floor until we cycle through the skull room once more before we finally end up in this room for one final time. It's just a linear path which they set up in a way so that it loops back to the skull room several times. And honestly, I think that's a really clever way to structure a dungeon. You know, we have a central memorable place that helps us to put all the different locations of the dungeon in relation to this room. And then the final puzzle takes place in a room where we actually started. And then the dungeon goes on for a couple of rooms which always felt entirely weird and wrong to me, but that's actually not what I want to talk about here. What I do want to talk about here is the Dodongo's eye puzzle, because the Dodongo's eye puzzle is really, really interesting. So the puzzle is the following. Basically, we're supposed to drop two bombs into the eyes of the giant dead head. This colors the eyes red and forces the skull to open its mouth. So how does Nintendo make sure that we actually find out that we're supposed to bomb the two eyes of this thing? Well, and this is where this gets interesting. They ensure this by simply spelling it out for us directly before we're supposed to do it. Yep, there's the sign immediately before we're supposed to bomb the eyes that reads, Giant Dead Dodongo. When it sees red, a new way to go will open. They, they basically tell us what to do right before we're supposed to do it. And at least in my humble opinion, that's one of the parts where the game really shows its age. Barely anyone would design a puzzle like that anymore nowadays. It's kind of, you know, bad design. They straight up tell us the solution to a puzzle before we even realize that there is a puzzle. Let's quickly speculate how a modern design team might tackle a problem like that. So first, we need a red crystal texture that looks a bit magical. Perfect. Next, we need to split the texture into two versions. One toned down one that looks like it is inactive and one with brighter colors and a bit of a glow that looks as if it is active. This texture is now our bomb me texture. Now it is our job to prime players to always drop a bomb as soon as they see this texture. You know, we might have a puzzle where a naive player gets manipulated by our evil design into boom flowering a crystal that uses our bomb me texture. As soon as the switch got boomed, it starts to glow. We might put this texture onto enemies that are are meant to be bombed. We use it over and over again until we taught our naughty player to always pull out the bomb bag as soon as she sees this texture. And then we would put the texture in the eye socket of the big Dodongo skull and suddenly our naive player would see the eyes and they would instinctively know what to do. Just because we unconsciously primed them that this texture means boom. Such a design would be much more elegant. It would have a natural escalation towards its final cinematic conclusion. And most importantly, our ease to manipulate player would feel great because he figured out the puzzle all on his own. Who, um, well not Ray, I guess. So here's the thing. I just lied to you. The better solution we just discussed was a setup. I actually do not believe that a solution like that would necessarily be better or that the current solution is bad. What we just discussed is probably really how most modern teams would tackle a puzzle like this, but, and that's the point of losing our point like this, this isn't a question of good design versus bad design. Because sadly, things rarely are simply good or bad. Different solutions to the same problem tend to cause different outcomes. And whether the outcome of a design
design is good or bad is situational and depends on what is intended. Designing the puzzle in a way that slowly teaches us the mechanics until we are able to see a simple texture on a skull and immediately know what to do is an elegant solution. Assuming we go about it correctly, it effortlessly teaches us what to do. And that is the exact problem that I have with a solution like that. In the end, it was effortless. It wasn't earned. It feels artificial. You know, we take our non-existent player by the hand and then slowly guide them towards the solution. All they have to do is to happily waddle behind us while we do all the work. And in the end, they see the skull and then they bump the skull and everyone feels great and happy. And then everyone forgets about the skull puzzle immediately afterwards again. Ultimately, a solution like that is really forgettable. It makes the dungeon feel like, well, you know, like a dungeon that some designers designed for us to explore with the honorable goal to maximize the fun we can potentially have at a certain moment in our life. But putting this weird sign there that kind of explains the puzzle to us is surprising in how weird and unexpected it is. The fact that the only hint on how to figure out the puzzle is placed directly before the puzzle also means that when we see the skull at the beginning, we don't get spoiled that the eyes are going to be a puzzle element later on. The dungeon just kind of loops back into itself and then we suddenly realize, oh, the path forward is behind the skull. We can open its mouth. It's surprising and unpredictable. You know, on a micro level, this puzzle might be bad, but it also adds a bit of unpredictability to the game. It makes the dungeon feel a bit more like a real mysterious place where everything can happen instead of like a theme park that some designers tinker together for us in a lab. Different systems evoke different feelings. Sometimes it might be a perfectly valid decision to design something in a tedious way, or to be frustrating, or to feel limiting, or out of place or whatever. A horror game might benefit from having slow and hard to use aiming controls for their shooty shooty gameplay. A story game might want to frustrate the player to hammer home how frustrated our character is at that point of the story. CD Projekt Red might have designed the release of Cyberpunk intentionally in this way, to make a clever meta commentary about misleading advertisement, about how we as society fail at giving big companies any incentive to follow any values except for greed and how the themes of dystopian capitalism that the game focuses on are actually uncomfortably close to the reality under which the game was developed and released. If that were the case, I'd truly have to say great job to whoever is making the decisions at CD Projekt Red. Well played. I'm totally losing my point. The point here is that a Zelda game might benefit from having a really weird out of place puzzle where they immediately spoil us the solution because it helps the game to stay unpredictable in the long run. It might benefit from having a one off puzzle where we have to remember a code which we then enter by beating up a bunch of deco scrubs, you know, to show how we are not familiar with everything in this world and how there are certain things that feel weird and unusual to us. It makes it impossible to predict everything that can possibly happen in a dungeon, which makes the dungeons feel much more mysterious. Also, that was the reason why we put a mental pain into the deco scrubs before. You're free to, you know, remove it. We don't need it anymore. You've done great. There is a feeling of mystery and wonder that can only be achieved if things don't follow a predictable pattern. The eye booming puzzle is one of the most memorable puzzles in the entire game for me. Whenever I think about the different dungeons of Ocarina of Time, opening the mouth of this skull that we passed several times before is just one of the images that first comes to my mind. And I believe that that is in part because of how unconventional the puzzle is designed. Five fuzzies. The Dongo's Cavern is just a sensationally designed Zelda dungeon. It loops back and forth several times, teasing us with the huge skull. And in the end, it delivers with a really interesting, memorable and unconventional puzzle. Hooray! Already two dungeons rated. We are breezing through the video today. Next, it is time for us to make our way up the river towards Sora's domain. First, we have to witness the objectively best part of the game. Before it is time for us to solve the worst puzzle in Ocarina of Time. And would you believe it, we are already in Chabu Chabu's belly. Five fuzzies. The third dungeon ended up being as brilliant as the two dungeons that came before it, at least in my humble Virginia. And I believe that is not by accident. See, the three child dungeons don't use keys. The very first time our hero, called Link, finds a key is in the forest temple. So that might actually be the perfect time for a quick clarification. So, you know, during the last video, I accidentally called Link Zelda, which, which was an honest and really unfortunate mistake, which I promise is never going to happen again. Anyway, so the first time Link 
encounters a key on his journey to save his beloved princess called Hyrule is in the forest temple as an adult. There aren't even boss keys in the first three dungeons. So I have no idea why Nintendo restricted themselves to not use any keys in the child dungeons. Maybe they wanted to reduce complexity in the beginning. Maybe it's for thematic reasons. You know, the first three dungeons are natural places in the world, while the adult dungeons are man-made, or maybe Miyamoto lost the bet. We will never know for sure, but what we do know, if we define knowing something as wild speculation for a second, is that this is one of those cases where restriction actually ended up breeding more creativity. The first three dungeons are structured in much more interesting ways than the later ones are, and I believe that is to a huge part because of the lack of keys. Not being able to simply lock off a room means that they have to come up with much more interesting ways to prevent the dungeon from becoming too linear. The Deku Tree has the memorable fall through the spider web. Dodongo's cavern loops several times through the same room in really interesting ways. And Jabu Jabu's belly, well Jabu Jabu's belly has a lovely key alternative in the form of the beautiful Sora Princess Ruto, that I'm still disappointed I never got to marry. She might be gone now, but a part of her still carries on. Princess Ruto is basically a carryable key. We first have to get her to the upper floor, which makes it possible to enter certain rooms by parking her on top of a couple of switches. This gives Jabu Jabu's belly a unique structure and is such a memorable gameplay mechanic. I love it. Jabu Jabu's belly, those are five fuzzies well earned. Good fish. So let's move on to the adult timeline. After causing a bit of a mishap that not only led to Princess Sheikah becoming trapped in a huge crystal, but also threw the land of Hyrule into a bit of a misfortune, we feel really bad and decide to try to make up for it. And thus we raid a grave to steal the hookshot before we make our way towards the fourth dungeon in the game. The forest dungeon. Eh. I'm not the biggest forest temple fan alive to be honest, there are two problems that I have with it. The first one is that hunting down the four ghosts is really tedious, especially since defeating them takes forever, but the second and much bigger problem is how the keys are introduced here. So check this out. This here is the first room of the dungeon. There is nothing but this door that leads to the forest dungeon's central hub. There are two wolves that immediately spawn in front of us and require our full attention. The whole room is a trap. The doorway is a huge focus point that pushes us to go through it, while the wolves are here to grab our attention so that we don't notice the vines in the background. If we do not notice those vines, however, and go through the door, then we're about to get seriously frustrated, because hidden at the top of those vines is a small chest containing the very first key in the game. Yep. That's how the keys are introduced. If we miss this key, then we're about to get completely stuck in the dungeon about an hour from now. We're about to find ourselves in front of a locked door without any real hint on how to open it. We have access to half the dungeon at this point, but absolutely no indication on where to find the missing key. We basically have to tediously screen all the rooms again until we finally notice the vine in the entrance room. When using keys there, if we simplify things a bit, two ways to use them. We can either actually hide them or make them impossible to miss. The very first key here is obviously hidden and I'm not a huge fan that they do this here. Hiding a key in an obscure place like at the top of the entrance room forces us to, well, you know, to search for it. That can be incredibly fun if the area we have to scan is really small, like only a couple of rooms or if we just found a new item that changes how we interact with the previous rooms. But if the area stretches over half of the dungeon and all the rooms are the exact same the second time through, then searching for the key feels like searching for the famous hay straw in a huge stack of needles. We end up without any direction and whether we find the key or not feels completely random and out of our control. The Forest Temple is an okayish dungeon that suffers from backtracking because of the horrible ways the keys are introduced, while the poet hunt sadly ends up being more tedious than fun. Hooray! So time to move towards the next dungeon, located in the middle of Death Mountain Crater, the Fire Dungeon. Three fuzzies. Honestly, there isn't that much to talk about here, the Fire Dungeon is just you know, it's fine. Having to free the different Gorons makes the dungeon a bit more memorable and is, you know, it's fine. It's just a fine dungeon. So let's move ahead to the next dungeon, which actually isn't the next one. The Shadow Temple. So the Shadow Temple usually only unlocks after finishing the Water Temple, but thanks to a couple of really unique and interesting glitches, it is actually possible to enter it as soon as we stole the hookshot. All that we have to do is to read a sign at the exact same time as we stab it. This causes Link's sword to become permanently active. We can attack every single frame now. But this also has a second really interesting consequence. It allows us to do bomb powers by backflipping into shieldable damage. And suddenly it is actually possible to enter the Shadow Temple early. So 
why do I bring this up? Well, because all the glitches, tricks and exploits that the community found and actually still finds are a really interesting and unique aspect of the game. For anyone who has never seen a speedrun of Ocarina of Time, I highly recommend checking one out. It is utter insanity what the loving community did to this poor game over the years. Bomb powering is one of the few glitches that I actually ever took the time to learn and I made it a bit of a habit of mine to grab the hover boots early in my playthroughs. If Ocarina of Time were to get released today, there's a high chance that the infinite sword glitch would get patched and suddenly this unique and interesting part of the game would be lost which would actually make the game a tiny bit less interesting and actually worse as a whole in my opinion. Anyway, so what do we do with the Shadow Temple? The Shadow Temple is one of the more linear dungeons in Ocarina of Time and I've often seen the Shadow Temple getting criticized for its linearity. The thing is just, I don't know, maybe that's just me? But I really really like the Shadow Temple and that might actually be because of its linearity. The Shadow Temple doesn't have the tedious backtracking that the Forest Temple suffers from. Instead it is a highly focused and more importantly an extremely atmospheric dungeon. The temple just truly feels like an evil place, the music is so dark and alien, yet dangerous at the same time. There are murderous traps hidden around every corner. At first we run through tight catacombs, but then the dungeon suddenly opens up and we enter this thrilling and gigantic underground hall built to murder us, it truly feels as if we venture deeper and deeper into cursed catacombs, slowly uncovering the evil slumbering in its depths. And then there is this final set piece where we have to fight long dead skeletons on top of a flying boat that probably references something from Greek mythology or something. I'll honestly never forget how incredibly scared the Shadow Temple made me feel as a kid. It's such an atmospheric experience, it feels so dangerous to venture deep into the depths of this grave. Shadow Temple, that's a perfect score of five perfect fuzzies for you. Great job. The Shadow Temple might not be the most complex puzzle box ever designed, but the Zelda Dungeon is about more than just being a complex series of connected puzzles. As I see it, the Zelda games aren't about puzzles alone, nor are they only about combat or about exploration. At their core, they try to be adventure games, and venturing deeper and deeper into the shadows of the, well, the Shadow Temple just feels like this hazardous part of a grand adventure to me. Awesome. Next, the ice caverns. So as it turns out, King Sora the Quick froze. That's a problem for us because the Sora King is the keeper of the water tunic, which allows its wearer to breathe underwater. We have to find a way to unfreeze the father of our favorite fish. Luckily, there is a cavern conveniently placed right behind his throne that contains the solution to our problem. And this cavern is weird. Um, hmm. So what do we do with the ice cavern? See. I am a fan of its inclusion, it's a real surprise that there is a mini dungeon waiting for us behind the Sora King and it serves as a really interesting pattern break. But more on this in a second, exploring the cave might not be the most exciting part of the game, but you know it is still a welcome inclusion as far as I am concerned. However, there is this one thing that annoys me to no end about the cave. The game doesn't tell us that we don't need the blue flames for anything again once we're done with the Soras. I always end up carrying around a blue flame in a bottle just in case we need it to reach a heart piece or something. On my most recent playthrough, I actually carried a flame right into Ganon's castle before I finally realized that I probably don't need the flame again. It's such a tiny problem, but it annoys me to no end. Honestly, they should have made the blue flames go extinct as soon as we leave Sora's domain or something, because as it is now, it always ends up logging one of my bottles. My dearest Ice Cave, I, I, I love you, but I also hate you. That's three fuzzies. I'm confused. Anyway, with the Sora King melted, we finally have all the tools required to take a deep dive into the Water Temple. A fan favorite, as I've been told. In 2009, The Guardian interviewed Eiji Aonuma. Aonuma worked as the director of Ocarina of Time and was responsible for the dungeon design. Let's read the beginning of the interview together, shall we? Eiji Aonuma, the director of the Legend of Zelda franchise, has an apology to make. The Water Temple in the Ocarina of Time was notorious for being very tough to conquer. He says, I am most sorry that it was not easy for you to put on and take off the heavy boots, that all the time you had to visit the inventory. I am, he continues, genuine regret evident in his tone. Very sorry about it. I should have made it much easier to switch to the heavy boots. 
Um, yeah, I tend to agree with the guy who designed the Watcher Temple. It's really bad. The dungeon forces us to change our boots over and over again. Every time, forcing us to open our inventory, navigate to the boots, equip the boots, and to save. It takes forever. It is bad and it is frustrating. But even without this problem, the dungeon wouldn't be that great in my probably faulty opinion. The backtracking is insane here, there are several hidden keys that are absurdly easy to miss and require the water to be at a specific height to collect, the final boss is boring and up until this day, I do not know how anyone is supposed to be Shadow Link without cheesing him. That is only one single and very lonely fuzzy. The fact that the creator of the dungeon felt the need to publicly apologize should speak for itself. Let's return back to Kakariko Village for a relaxing glass of milk after this horrible dungeon. But wait, what is this? Oh no, Kakariko Village is burning. Luckily, Sheik is here, who, spoiler alert, is actually Princess Peach in disguise. After surviving an attack by a terrible force, Sheik is nice enough to warn us that there is an evil evil that is caved. Time for us to become a child again and to explore the bottom of the well. So the bottom of the well is a really, really weird place in Ocarina of Time. Everything here is a bit out of place. First, the place is surprisingly dark for a Zelda game. There are blood splatters everywhere. There are torture instruments standing around. There are chains hanging from the wall. And there are re-deads <laughs> everywhere. It is just an unusual dark and brutal setting for the Zelda series. Second, the whole thing is incredibly confusing. There are tons of invisible paths, there are keys that are necessary for progression, but just unlock rooms that are entirely optional. The way the Lens of Truth is hidden here is really strange. The complete thing just feels as if it does not belong in a Zelda game. And I believe that this isn't by accident. I believe that all of this is for a very simple and brilliant reason. Braid is a really fascinating little game. For anyone not familiar with Braid, it is basically a puzzle platformer built around manipulating time. Its main gimmick is that it is possible to rewind time at any point, which it uses for its mind-boggling puzzles. Braid is a really unique and important game for several reasons, one of them being that it was one of the first indie games to really reach a mainstream audience, but it is also remarkable for how focused its design is. The game is extremely tightly designed. There is no waste of space or elements. Everything in the game is played there for a reason. If there are enemies, they serve a purpose. If there is a cannon, then it is needed for a puzzle. If there is a ladder that leads to a higher place, then we absolutely have to climb it at one point. You get the idea. Braid tries to be as focused as a game possibly can be. Except when it doesn't. There is this one random spot towards the end of the second world where we just have to waddle past a bunch of enemies for what feels like an eternity. This is the only spot in a game like that. Braid never does something like that before and it never wastes space and becomes unfocused like that afterwards. It's just this one little spot where the game suddenly drops all of its focus for a moment. Why does the game do that? Luckily for us, I have a little conspiracy theory on why Braid is designed. What do you mean by that's no conspiracy theory? Oh, the design of Braid mentioned in the talk why he designed it like that? Okay, um... Uh, I guess we don't need that done today. In 2011, Jonathan Blow, the creator of Braid, played through the entirety of the game at a Game City event while waffling about his thoughts when designing the different parts. And luckily for us, he also talked about why the game suddenly loses all its focus at this point for a second. It is meant to be a pattern break. Video games tend to work in repeating patterns. You know, we enter a new stage and collect 7 stars in it in Mario 64. Every time. We find a new item in every dungeon that we enter in Ocarina of Time. That is a reoccurring pattern. Every time we defeat a dungeon boss, we are rewarded with a heart container. You, you get the idea. The thing is, if we play a game long enough, we start to recognize those patterns and become able to predict them. You know, Ocarina of Time never explicitly tells us that defeating a boss always rewards us with a heart container, but after defeating the third boss, we're probably able to predict that the next boss will drop one as well. And with something like a heart container, that is absolutely no problem. But it's not always that simple. If players, for example, start to notice that every single unlit torch needs to be lit at some point, then the puzzles around torches become predictable. If they start to recognize that the first big chest in every dungeon contains the map, then they will be less excited about opening that first chest. And if players recognize that every single element in a game is carefully placed 
and serves purpose, well, then they might start to ask what the intention of the designer was when placing this instead of seeing the element for what it represents in the game. And then it suddenly really becomes a problem, because then it breaks the fourth wall between player and designer. So what is the solution to that problem? Well, it is to design intentional pattern breaks, like the one in Braid. This area intentionally doesn't follow the design rules used for the rest of the game. First, this makes this area really interesting and unique all on its own, but second, it also helps to prevent that the game becomes predictable. So what has this to do with the bottom of the well? Well, the bottom of the well uses several different pattern breaks that help to make it a memorable and unique place and prevents Ocarina of Time from becoming too predictable. The area has keys that are not necessary for progression. The whole dungeon is a mini dungeon in between dungeons, something Ocarina of Time only does twice. The dungeon doesn't really have an end, you know, we just pick up the lens of truth at some point and then we can leave it again, or we stay and explore some more. There's no defined point when we're done with it, it's just a place in Hyrule that happens to contain the lens of truth. It breaks so many patterns that Ocarina of Time used up until this point and I love it for that. Intentional pattern breaks are an art that tons of modern games just don't remember how to do anymore. Ocarina of Time on the other hand is amazing at it. The stone tablet that spoils us the solution on how to solve the Dodongo's eye puzzle is a single time event. The fire temple has a weird Goron saving gimmick. Some temples have no gimmick at all. Some temples are built around backtracking and looking for keys, others are much more linear. Dodongo's cavern can be re-entered as an adult to find a bunch of Skaltalas. The other child dungeons can't. The amount of content in between the different dungeons varies drastically. Sometimes the next dungeon is just 15 minutes away after beating one, sometimes it's hours. Ocarina of Time just does tons of different things in order to not become too predictable and to break its own patterns. And I believe that this is a pretty important, though lesser discussed piece of the brilliant puzzle that Ocarina of Time is. So what is our final score for the bottom of the well? Well, it's four fantastic fuzzies. The bottom of the well might not be the most exciting part of the game, it might not feature the best puzzles or the coolest encounters or anything, but it is a worthwhile inclusion simply for how much it does to break the patterns that Ocarina of Time otherwise often uses. Which leaves us with one final temple before we are finally able to find out which Ocarina of Time dungeon is the objectively best one in my opinion and which one I subjectively believe to be the objectively worst. So let's quickly rescue a couple of arrested carpenters out of the Gerudo Fortress, because this not only causes us to gain the knowledge required to make it through the desert, but it also grants us a membership card to an exclusive girls club. How exciting. And thus it is time for us to explore the spirit temple. Four fuzzies. The spirit temple is the logical final dungeon for the game. It tests us for one final time at all the core components. The black knights provide a tough combat challenge. The fact that we have to enter it once as a kid and once as an adult neatly ties a core element of the game together. The puzzles there are reasonably challenging. There is this cool final puzzle where we have to bust the statue's head with the power of light. It's just, you know, just a really cool final dungeon for the fantastic game that Ocarina of Time is, and honestly, I don't have much else to say about it. Hooray! So here we have it, all the wonderful and mysterious dungeons of the wonderful and mysterious Ocarina of Time finally made their way into a wonderful and mysterious tier list. All that's left to do for us now is to answer the eternal question, which one of the dungeons is the best one and which one is the worst? So let's start with the worst one. And the nominees for the title worst dungeon in the Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time are the Water Temple, Um, yeah, that's it. Congratulations to the Water Temple for taking the prize. Not only is the Water Temple full of tedious backtracking, but the fact that we have to enter the menu to change our boots over and over again is so horrific that even the designer of the dungeon felt the need to publicly apologize for it. Hooray. Next, let's find out which dungeon is, in my opinion, the objectively best one in the game. And the nominees are Dodongo's Cavern, for being a wonderfully structured dungeon with a really unique final puzzle. Chabu Chabu's Belly, for being a dungeon set in an incredibly unique place while featuring one of the most charming gameplay gimmicks ever. And the Shadow Temple, for being an incredibly adventurous and atmospheric place full of dangerous traps and memorable moments. So this mysterious box, hopefully, knows the answer. Um, the mysterious box contained a mysterious envelope. Uh, this envelope knows which dungeon I believe to be the objectively best one. And the winner is Chabu Chabu's Belly.
Jabu Jabu's Valley is just brilliant for so many different reasons. It has a unique gimmick that ties a lovely story element neatly into gameplay. It has a unique structure, a wonderful setting, and most importantly, it's just a blast to play through it. Jabu Jabu's Valley, you are officially my favorite fish in video gaming history. For now. So here we have it, our final list. I hope you enjoyed this little video. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to leave me a thumbs up and maybe you feel especially like breaking your usual subscription pattern today and want to hit the subscribe button as well. I hope that all of you have a wonderful day and to see you soon. Goodbye!